Hey everyone, welcome back to the Growing Together podcast with me, Sunny Vasquez. And me, Cesar Santos. A podcast where we talk about everything under the sun related to growth. And today's episode is super special, super exciting um, because we actually get to talk with the CEO of the company that I work for, Composely. I've been working there for about almost, I think August makes like 10 months. So I've made it this far. <laughs> um, f- clearly, I'm not doing too bad of a job. Um, but yeah, I've learned a lot in my time there. And we are a smaller startup company. We're growing actually quite rapidly, but we are still very much a startup. So I thought it'd be a great idea to bring on Mike. And I'm really glad he said yes, because he could have said no. So I'm really mm-hmm. excited. But would you like to introduce yourself, Mike? Like, who are you and how did you get to where you are? Well, firstly, thanks so much for having me on, guys. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's nice to meet you, Caesar. Uh, Sonny, you are uh, you're too humble. Uh, Sonny's <laughs> been uh, a driving force in the company and everybody knows Sonny because she puts a smile on everyone's face, but also oh. because she does amazing work and has done a great job. So um, I was more than happy to... Uh, to join and, and speak with you guys. Um, so yeah, my name is Mike Leonard. I uh, I grew up in New Jersey. I uh, went to school in Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh. Um, and then after um, after graduation, I um, I moved back to New Jersey and uh, started work there at a, a large um, Fortune 500, well Fortune 100 company, Accenture, a consulting company before uh, moving abroad for a little stint, uh, a couple of years in Asia, and then I moved back to California. Um, and then uh, I got married to my beautiful wife, Amanda, and I have a uh, four-year-old little girl, Mila, um, who's just the um, the mm-hmm. apple of my eye. Um, so I have two beautiful girls in my life that mean everything to me. And, um, and uh, you know, and In around uh, 2015, the idea of Composely started to come about, um, and around 2016 is where it really started to come together, uh, and I really kind of went in um, heavy into uh, leading and growing this business, and so that's how it kind of got to where it is today, and and, uh, we were fortunate enough to get Sonny um, brought into the to the team and like I said she's been doing a great job so that's a little bit about me but um would be happy to answer uh, any other questions or, or dive deeper into anything uh you guys would love like to know more about yeah so I think my first question because this podcast we talk a lot about growth and we kind of chose growth because there's so many areas in our life that we have to grow in whether it's like personally professionally, spiritually, all the kind of things. Um, but how would you define growth? And I guess you could kind of like put like two definitions, like how would you define professional growth but versus like personal growth? That's a good question. I mean, I think e- either way, it's, 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 to me, it's a process of development. It's, um, uh, you know, how you evolve over time. Um, and that could be, like you said, personal, it could be professional, it could be emotional. Um, I think there's so many ways that you can develop over time through experiences and through mentorship. Um, and so, yeah, I think, um, a lot of them are interrelated. You know, I feel like uh, growth in general, growing as a human being, part of that is through relationships, personal relationships. Some of that is through professional relationships. Um, Some of it's through experiences when you go to school and when you're working at a company. And so I really feel like just personal personal growth and, and professional growth um, are so tightly coupled in how you develop um, as a person. And, um, you know, I think, it's really interesting when you see people who do something that they're really passionate about, because I feel like then those two really mix together because you're, you're kind of, you're mixing, um, sometimes what is personally fulfilling is also professionally, um, fulfilling. And so, uh, if you're really lucky, I think for people who are really lucky, you know, they love what they're doing, um, and it helps them to develop as a person as well. Um, people who hate their job, you know, that's a, that's a totally different story, and uh, and you can learn from that experience as well. Um, so I know I'm kind of 
going on going on here, but I think it is the process of development and um, and and evolution. And you know, the more experiences you have, the more you can grow, both good uh, good and bad experiences, um, both professional and and personal experiences. Yeah, we actually kind of discussed on here because um, on one of our other podcasts we discussed that um, there are some people who see like work as something like that they just have to do and like they're not as they're not as like they're not people who want to see like to pursue a career because it's something they're passionate about more so just they're pursuing a career to fund whatever they want to do on the side um Mm -hmm. and i think there's people who don't really like mind what their career is just they look at it as a source of income but i think for me that was something super important for me is that what I do is what I'm passionate about because I think that does have to do with like your growth and development. If you're happy in your career, you're going to be happy in other areas of your life and you're going to like spend time on like what makes you happy. Um, so I do like that you say that because I do think that they're hand in hand. I think the fact that if you like your job and you're doing what you love, it's going to help aid that growth because you're going to want to grow in your career. You also want to grow as a person and they do go hand in hand. I think I learned a lot. Like I mentioned Target on this podcast all the time, but um, <laughs> I learned a lot working there, especially at such a young age. Um, I learned a lot working there and I didn't like it, but it definitely, it kind of shaped me as a person because that was my first like real like big girl job because I was in leadership and I was like having to like you know influence other people and I was like I don't even know how to I don't know how to do this but Mm. um yeah it definitely was it's important to me that's why I mean I love Composely because I remember hearing about the opportunity and I was like I remember telling Caesar like I got a message from the CEO like he wants to interview me I was like I've got to kill this interview because I actually want this job I had done a couple other interviews and I was not really super set on the positions I was just like eh, like I need a job so like I could take this one but so I was really excited. I think Caesar remembers that I too. I was like too. telling him, I was like, there's this company, Composely. Um, and I don't know if I told you, but like my brother had literally a year before this had mentioned, like I was looking for like freelance opportunities while I was at Target, had mentioned Composely because I do a lot of writing. He was like, oh, you should apply to be a writer. And he had sent me the link. He was like, oh, I, I found this company. It. And I was like, oh yeah, like maybe I'll do it. And I never did. But no, I didn't I, know that. That's interesting. Yeah, I never did. I was just like, oh. So, like, when I heard it, I was like, it seems familiar. And I went back <laughs> through my text thread. And I was like, oh, my gosh. My brother had literally told me about this company a year ago. So, I feel like h- how things come f- full circle in your life are yeah. so wild. I do want to add, like, I, I, you know, I think most people are probably not super um, uh maybe passionate or in love with the, the the job that they currently have. I would yeah. say most people are probably not. Um, and not to pass judgment on anyone because sometimes having a job is a means to a greater end. Yeah. You know, for example, you know, working during college to pay off college because, you know, you may not like that job, but what it's going to do is give you the resources you need to pay for college, get through college so that you can move on to something bigger and better. And there have been a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of people that have started their idea on the side, right? Their passion project on the side while working a job that maybe wasn't the perfect fit for them. So, you know, I think it's um, it's not a perfect equation and yeah. it's really hard to get to a place where you're able to be fully focused on something that really um, motivates you and drives you and that you're super passionate about um, every day. Uh, that's a really hard thing to do. That's why like a lot of athletes, you know, they, they work very hard, but they're so fortunate because that's what they wanted to do since yeah. they were a kid. Yeah. They wanted to play baseball or play football. And and if they're lucky enough and they work hard enough, they get to do what they love every day. Um, so yeah, that's that's what we could. It's all you could uh, you can hope for for everybody, but it doesn't always. It's not always a perfect equation like that. I'm so. glad you say that because I got a lot of crap from people on Instagram. I posted this clip from a podcast saying how I think that you should do what you're passionate about, and people said you are so naive, Sunny. It's like not everyone can do what they're passionate about. Like, and I was like, no, I understand that. I have had the crappy jobs. I have done what I needed to do, but I was like, but it don't like use it as an excuse because you think that you can't it's like yeah obviously we all have to provide for ourselves we all got to do what we need to do um to make things work but i think a lot of people 
to like the other end do use it as an excuse to never get out of their situations it's like a fear thing of like oh well i need this and this is like not as of a show thing so they don't go after it because like this is a show thing this might not work out but i'm kind of the person that's like well it might not work out but we'll figure it out kind of thing so i got called naive on instagram and i'm like i gotta stop reading these comments because not everyone's gonna agree (laughs) with all the time too (laughs) i gotta realize people don't agree with my opinions which is fine because they are just opinions and i think i've been fortunate enough at a young age to actually enjoy what i want to do because my parents were definitely like sonny you just need a job it doesn't matter what it is and i was like no absolutely not i need to love my job um Mm -hmm. which from a parent's perspective too they they my parents are always worried about me especially being so far away from them um but when i when i was looking for a job my dad was like you could just go back to target and i was like absolutely not like (laughs) i did everything I could to leave there. I am not going to go back. I was like, I understand that you're worried and that I need money. I will figure it out. I will do everything but that. Um, Mm. Because it was, for me, it was also a pride thing. At that point, I was like, I finally left Target. I cannot go back. I knew I could get another job there. And it's not that hard to get a job there. But um, I definitely wasn't going to go back to that. Uh, but well, yeah. it seems like it's turned out well uh, yeah, so thank God. far. Yeah. And I have a feeling it's only going to get better for you. I uh, used to tell Caesar though, like um, whenever I first started and you would send me a message on like Slack, um, you'd be like, hey, Sunny. And then I knew that you were going to follow up with like some type of question, but I was always so anxious. And sometimes you don't reply all right away. I'm like, okay, I'm getting fired. <laughs> yeah. I was like, Mike's going to fire me today. I don't know why, but I'm for sure getting fired. So like, that's where my mind goes. I have such bad anxiety luckily i it's always not like i'm just that's just me um but it's so funny i work at i think when you work at like places that are actually good for you when you come from like toxic places it's kind of hard to like realize that the people on your team do want what's best for you and they do um i mean this is a really great team i talk to caesar about it all the time and caesar obviously hears a lot of our zoom calls because he's he's sitting behind me he's like oh he'd be like how's douglas or how's mike i heard them say this and i'm like yeah he's just basically an employee (laughs) exactly it's always really interesting to hear what you guys are doing so and more than likely that message was sunny i hear you're doing a great job keep up (laughs) or it was to just talk and strategize about something but uh, yeah it's it's so funny i'd like get so anxious and i'm like there's no reason to ever be anxious like they're not gonna fire you um but obviously we've grown a lot i think when i first started at composely we were like at least eight people less than we are now i mean yeah eight people less than we are now we have like 24 employees i think um Mm -hmm. which is crazy to see in like less than a year's time because i joined last november um what do you think have been like the greatest challenges you face when you've been building the company to where it is now Oh yeah, there I there are a lot, there are a lot <laughs> of challenges. You know, I feel like um, it's like growing pains, right? Yeah. You have different um, awkward moments while you're growing up and uh, and you're learning. Um, we are uh, we are a marketplace, right? So we have um, writers on one side and uh, talented writers on one side, and then we have clients who need content on the other. And balancing those two is um, is not always an easy thing to do. Uh, you know, you look at Uber, you look at any any other you know kind of marketplace platform where you know if you don't have enough drivers and people can't actually get drivers when they're calling for a car, it's a disaster. And if you have too many drivers and they don't feel like they can get enough work then they're going to drop like flies too, because they're going to go to another platform that does have work for them. And so I think those same kind of principles apply to us. And um, in the early days, I would say it was hard to get the supply side set up. We needed to get talented writers. How do you do that? Um, We ended up purchasing uh, freelancewriting.com as uh, a way to funnel. uh, So freelancewriting.com is actually a destination more for freelancers than it is for people looking for freelancers. Um, So it was more of a resource for freelancers. And that really helped us to uh, funnel a lot of candidates into, um, you know, into our writer pool and, and find good, talented writers. 
Um, so that was the initial thing was like, how do we create a, a team of writers or a community of writers that can support our clients? Um, and then the, the complete opposite issue occurs where, okay, well, we got writers. Now we got to get uh, customers, more <laughs> customers. And uh, I would say that was probably the even bigger challenge was, you know, how do we get more clients more quickly? And um, I think initially we thought of Composely primarily as e-commerce so that people would come into our website. We'd have website visitors who would create accounts and then would, would be connected with writers through the platform. Um, and you can do that. You can, you've always been able to do that. You can still do that today. Um, but in the early stages, uh, we were completely bootstrapped. We don't, we, we didn't have any, um, you know, outside funding. So we just knew that we had to drive re revenue as quickly as possible um, to, to drive growth. And so, yeah, we just got gritty, um, and which uh, is, at, uh, is one of our core values actually is grit. Um, but we got pretty gritty and um, we just went out hunting. Um, and Alejandro, who's our chief revenue officer, myself, I mean, in the early days, we were in the trenches. We were doing a lot of outreach. We were doing a lot of sales. Um, and, uh, and that, and that worked out for us. We were able to start bringing on more and more clients much more rapidly than we would have, if we just kind of sat there waiting for them to come in through the e-commerce route. Yeah. Um, and so that, that was one of the biggest challenges was just how do we get kind of a base of clients? Um, and you know, in the early days as well, you don't know exactly how you should price your service. What are the key pain points your customers are having? Um, you know, you're really sort of just winging it in a, in, in a lot of ways. And I'm sort of the type that, um, uh, you know, I, I say it a lot, but sometimes uh, perfection is the enemy of progress where, you know, I was just like, let's just start and we'll figure things out as we go. So we may not have the perfect, we may not have pricing set up in the perfect best way. We may not have our service um, set up in the most appealing way. But by just getting out there and talking with prospective customers and, and acquiring new customers, we were able to learn more and more what are what's the value proposition from our side that resonates the most with our with our clients and you know what were their major pain points that we could address for them. Um, and that was a learn that was uh, huge for us because over time, the more customers we got, the more we could see trends, the more we learned, okay, this is what really matters to them. And this is where we should focus our time and energy. We got better at fine tuning our pricing to make sure it appeals to the customer. Um, and so we just started, things started to kind of fall into place better and better over time, just by getting out there and talking to, um, talking to the customer. Um, so I know, you know, the original question was, you know, what were the major challenges? I would say the supply side, the supply demand, keeping those two balanced and then just really kind of um, better getting a better understanding of our customers and what matters to them so that we could really I felt like we were kind of casting a really wide net. Yeah. Um, and then over time, we learned how to kind of really hone in and and, and um, find who our ideal customer is and target better uh, 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 on that specific type of customer uh, that our product resonates with the most. I like that because I, I studied marketing in school and they kind of teach you like like, you know, how to write a business plan, like the things that you need to know essentially to start a company, but they teach it in a very linear way, as if like this is exactly how the steps you should take to start a company. But I think a lot of people who end up starting a successful company, it's kind of very scattered. You might have the idea first and then get one thing right, but like come up with the things, other things later, or for instance, like defining your customer, actually like providing what they need. And I think that's where a lot of like companies do fail i think it's like i did research one time a lot of startup companies do fail and one of the reasons is um because they're they're not actually providing something that their customer wants a lot of people like to think like what they know what the customer wants without actually doing the research and then they provide a product and it's like well this is not actually what the customer wanted so i think composely actually has done a really great job of providing listening to our clients because obviously we've also increased like our services that's how i got the job is the fact that you guys are increasing the services you offered so now we offer like you know seo briefs um, more optimized content and um 
that's honestly, I think it's from like feedback from our clients, if I'm not wrong, like it's from feedback from clients for one yeah. who want SEO um, optimized content, but also like it's a great way so they don't have to do all the planning because now I do it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I actually wanted to follow up with a question um, that uh, uh, with the, what Sunny said earlier was I know that especially right now, like a lot of a lot of big companies, they're not they're not moving towards like advertised um, growth, like where they throw ads out to try to get growth for like whatever their business is uh, or do you see like in the next few years where the organic uh the way to throw organic of uh, like funds to like towards your guys's stuff which you guys do in order to grow their business like towards organic growth through search is that like a trend you're seeing yeah and i guess maybe i'll take a step back for anyone who's watching the podcast about what Composely really does because um, we are a content creator we create content for businesses and to, to i think caesar's question the majority of that content the objective is to get uh more eyeballs on the brand uh for the clients we're working with um we usually do that uh by helping them to rank for keywords so for example if you're uh you know, email marketing, uh, email soft software service, um, and you help companies with their email marketing, we would then, um, you know, we would then help them rank for keywords like, you know, email marketing or email marketing strategies. And so we help them to create great content that sets them up as an authority in their industry, in their space, um, but then also uh, helps them to rank on, on Google and, and drive valuable traffic into their website, uh, potential buyers into their website, people who would be interested in what they have to offer. Uh, and then to your question, Caesar, yeah, I mean, I think this has to the, the companies that are savvy with SEO, I think they've known for a long time that organic, the ROI from organic is far beyond that of paid, um, paid advertising. Um, if you are skilled and fortunate enough to rank number one for whatever it is you do, for anyone searching for what service you provide and you rank number one, um, you're going to capture a massive amount of traffic, a massive amount of potential leads into your business that your competitors are not. Um, and the, the difference between paid advertising is you're, you're paying per click mm -hmm. typically. So uh, on Google, for example, if you run an ad for everyone searching for your service and everybody that clicks that, you're paying per click. But if you can rank organically and not that it's free, it takes work to yeah, rank, yeah, exactly. you know, number one, you, you, you need to be smart and execute a good strategy. But if you can achieve that number one position and maintain it, the ROI there um, vastly exceeds what you would get uh, for the spend that you would put into paid advertising. So yeah, I think there are a lot of companies that are are acutely aware of that and that have put a lot of um, a, a lot of budget and and, and resources into uh, their organic strategy. And I think that's you know really mostly for um, more savvy digital digitally um, savvy companies that you know digital marketing is something they they put a big investment into. I think like too, like paid advertising, ha I think paid advertising for one will always have its place. Yeah. Um, there's different, like there's a way to make sure that you reach your audience, which is why a lot of companies still do it. And I think they always will. It's going to get a little bit different when they, um, you know, Google just announced they're moving like the cookie list future to 2024. Um, so that's going to change the way they do it too. But there's always going to be a place for it because it's a, it is an easier way to target your audience and yeah. like it's just the roi on organic traffic is i mean it's cheaper in a way obviously you do need to pay someone usually to have a member of your team do it um it's not it's not as simple as we all would like it to be but um no of course definitely that, yeah. organic i i'm yeah. always i'm like such an organic person too like me and caesar have been messing around with like tiktok and instagram and um figuring out like those algorithms and like driving like organic following and like making sure like just organic reach in general and it's um it's really interesting for sure to see like we've seen kind of like a lot of growth on instagram especially which is exciting um but even with youtube oh, that's actually what i was gonna say it was youtube um i'm in the content space on youtube and one of the biggest driving factors for uh, content creators that ended up growing a business out of what they do on YouTube is targeting those high, highly searched 
uh, low ranking uh, keywords on YouTube because in a sense YouTube's a search engine too. And that was actually one thing I was gonna ask you guys if, if sooner or later you guys would grow or expand your business into those other types of uh, search engines, not just not just Google itself. Yeah, yeah. The, the short answer is yes. Yeah. The plan is definitely to expand there, not only for our own business, but then uh, uh, assisting other companies in, yeah. in achieving that as well. Um, so definitely that's on the horizon. Um, and I was also just going to add real quick, real quick that, you know, uh, I think, Sonny, you were alluding to this earlier, but the, you know, paid advertising and organic um, are uh they're not mutually exclusive. So, you know, in fact, I think, you know, if, if I were to give advice to any company or any business, I would say uh, the two kind of go hand in hand yeah. and you should be doing both. Um, and, you know, another strategy, for example, that the beauty of advertising. So like if you're starting day one, you're a brand new business and you're starting day one, it takes months and months potentially to rank. If yeah. not, longer, you know, it could take a year, years, you know, of, of work. So um, what do you do in the meantime, you know, if you're not getting leads, if you're on page four, page three, page yeah. two of, of, you know, the search term that um, you're targeting, you know, it's not going to drive any meaningful traffic to you until you get into that striking range. Um, so what do you do? Well, if you turn on uh, Google ads, for example, the moment you flip the switch and you turn it on, you will be present on page one, you know, where people can actually see you, yeah. you pay for it, but you're there. Um, and then a, and a lot of companies will use that as testing too, so that through ads, uh, you can see, well, what are the keywords that are converting the best? What are the keywords that are getting the most engagement? And that can help power your organic strategy to say, okay, those are the words, those are the keywords that we want to focus on. Those are the ones we want to target. So if you think about it and you put an investment into like one month of put, putting money into ads, you run ads across various keywords. And at the end of the month, you do kind of a an analysis and you see what are the keywords that perform the best that got yeah. the most clicks that got the most conversions that that can help provide valuable information for your seo strategy in terms of what are the keywords that we want to focus on that are likely to drive uh customers that will convert uh so yeah i i think the two are hand in hand and will continue to be for for a long time and then you guys mentioned social there's organic social yeah. and there's paid social and i yeah. think the same principle probably applies there as well yeah, yeah, that's that's true. It's like they really do. And when you think about it like that, if you're like just starting if you're on day one, like there is SEO is a long term strategy. I say this all the time because and you can do everything by best practice and still it doesn't work out. So if you're looking for like sure thing to definitely help you get some traffic, it's going to be um, paid advertising. Oh, I was literally I had a question. <laughs> I, I was, was going to say, I hope we're not geeking out too much about SEO. <laughs> no, I think <laughs> it's... Anybody. I know we all uh, we all really love it oh, and, uh, you know, can dive into the details. It's fun. And this is what Sonny and I will do internally. Uh, Always. Too, <laughs> but, um, I'm trying to but, think yeah. of what I was going to say. It was such a good question. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, I love it. I talk to Caesar all day, I feel like, about SEO. So he's definitely like... And I think it's uh, helped me too because well, I've learned... We've learned yeah. about like the a YouTube lot. part like of like optimizing a video. So, um, you know, if we ever do want to get that service, I have some knowledge. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, it's definitely... Um, <laughs> I don't remember what I was going to say. Um, oh, that's what I was going to say. So obviously, like what you've grown composedly and like it's pretty successful now and I think it's going to continue to be successful we have some pretty large clients uh but is this kind of what you envisioned you like yourself doing did, at any point in like your younger years like when you were a teenager did you like did you ever think to yourself like oh I want to start a business like I'll be a business owner I'll be like my own boss or is it just something that kind of like came up and you're like yeah I could do this you know I think when I I remember when I was really young, I wanted to be a marine biologist <laughs> oh, wow. and, that, and then that changed. I, I um, uh, And then I got really into kind of technology. Like, I think, um, you know, I'm quite a bit older than you guys. So, uh, <laughs> oh, really? you know, before <laughs> mobile phones and before, um, you know, touchscreen displays and before even just having a computer at home, right, was was um, was a big thing. And so I, I kind of was an early adopter in, in, in that in that way. And I, so I always felt like I wanted to be involved in technology. I like really enjoyed just 
you know, it's kind of a very broad statement, but just technology in, in general. Um, and so I think like, as I started getting older, I started thinking, oh, I want to be in computer science. I want to be in, you know, I, I want to be an engineer or I want to be doing something very technical. Um, and, and then I think, uh, but then yes, I guess the direct answer to your question was, I always kind of felt like, yeah, I would love to run a business. You know, I'd actually love to run my own business and, and, you know, I had aspirations for that. And so I think my, in my head, that sort of the idea sort of morphed a little bit into, you know, uh, keeping a technology element, but running a business and having technology as a part of that. Um, my last job before um, the last company I worked for before uh, Composely um, was a mobile accessories um, manufacturer. And, uh, you know, all of that is it's it it's not software related at all it was actually physical products and selling physical products and retail stores and how do you get physical product um, from factories into the country and in the right place at the right time and um so it's very different and with compose i was really glad to get back sort of to the roots of where i wanted to be where technology is an element of um is an element of the business because we do have a marketplace we do have a platform um that we're going to continue growing and evolving over time um but i i did have some aspirations to you know to run a business when i was younger i didn't have a clear picture of what that looked like you know what that really meant um so if, i don't know if i you know took a snapshot right now and showed that to my younger self if i would if if my younger self would say oh that's where that's exactly what i was thinking <laughs> um you know I, I i i don't you know probably not um but i but i definitely when i was growing up i did have this kind of entrepreneurial bug i guess where i i you know i always kind of expected that i would be trying to run a business at some point in my life yeah i mean i i i think that too like no one really knows like what they want i think we try to plan for our lives of like oh like i'll do this and then i'll do this but it honestly doesn't again like growth and like where you end up isn't linear either i definitely thought that i'd be at a different place i mean i'm so young so people are going to yell at me for this but like i thought i'd be at a different place at 24 you know i still have four wait like yeah, four years be to be on Forbes 30 under 30. So I got a little bit of time. Um, but um, I definitely thought it'd be a lot different. I thought I'd go into a marketing job right after college. Couldn't have predicted COVID. So <laughs> that messed up my plans quite a bit too. Um, even then, I never thought I'd be working in SEO. And the only reason I am is because I did a digital marketing boot camp because I was scammed by college and thought I had all the knowledge I needed to be successful. Um, <laughs> so um, I did a digital marketing boot camp and literally one tiny section was on SEO. And I was like, this could be cool. And I just started researching. I was like, oh, how do you do this? Um, so if I hadn't done that, I probably would have just been looking for like any marketing job. Um, mm -hmm. which can be difficult too because there's so many different jobs and marketing that you can go into. Um, but I think one thing to like kind of pivot to is I think the great thing about Composely is our team and growing that team. And what do you, how did you define what that was going to look like for Composely and how you were going to onboard great team members? I believe that my primary responsibility as the CEO of the company is to find great people. I think that's any CEO's um, uh, objective. And, you know, typically as a company grows, you have, you start to have layers, right? You start to have levels and there's more kind of separation between executive level down to entry level. Um, and so I think it's really important to set a very clear tone about what um, success at the company looks like uh, for any individual, like what's expected of any individual. And uh, so I think it's insanely important and something that, you know, I, I'm always kind of trying to build a dream team. And we talk about this a lot, but we, you know, we keep it, we have a lean, um, but a highly effective team. And I want to keep it that way. Um, you know, we've come up with our core values that we think kind of represent what uh, what we're looking for and what will help our uh, employees to be successful. We mentioned one already, like uh, grit is one of them. Um, uh, ownership, inclusivity, 
um, are, are some of the, the values that we kind of hold dear that we're looking at not only when we're interviewing people to bring them on, but also when we're um, evaluating their uh, performance and are they demonstrating those values. So um, the team the team growth is, is critical and, and that's more on the kind of the cultural side and just in terms of who we're looking for. We're looking for great people um, that fit that you know that that fit that mold or that um that demonstrate all, all of those values but then there's also like the strategic side of of growing with people which is you know who should i hire next like mm-hmm. not who as a person but what what role should we have next because you're always looking at especially at our stage um, you mentioned a couple times now that you know I, I I don't yet consider Composely a success. There are successes we've had, yeah. but I don't feel we're quite there. Um, you know, we're certainly not Google, right, uh, <laughs> yeah. or, or Apple. Um, and God willing, you know, we'll, we'll be able to uh, we'll be able to, to to achieve some modicum of that that level of success. Um, but you know, we are we are still. Um, experiencing all the challenges of a business in their adolescence, I would say. And uh, that's kind of where we're at. And um, it's fun and it's exciting. And those are the challenges. You know, when we get to 100 people, there will be totally different challenges. Um, And so right now, we're definitely at a point where every role, we're looking at what's the that role's impact to the business. What is the impact that, you know, we don't have the luxury of because we're not funded um, externally uh, or because we don't have the resources of a company like Google or Amazon, you know, we have to be very, 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 very strategic in every new person we bring on and understand very clearly what the ROI they will deliver for the company is. Um, And so we're still, you know, we're still doing that. And and I don't think we ever want to stop doing that, no matter how yeah, you know, I think it's important to maintain that mentality because once you have more resources and once you have uh, more people, you know, if you start to get lazy about the, especially personnel decisions, I think that is kind of how your empire fails, right? That's how it falls. And um, so, so yeah, people are paramount. Uh, I mean, it's what makes the company what it is. Um, and, you know, it's something that I'm constantly focused on you know, how, who, who um, you know, who should we be hiring? And then not only that, but who's doing really well within the company? Who um, do we need to recognize and reward and make sure that, you know, um, they're happy and that they never leave, right? That's, exactly. uh, that's the goal. It's and like, then conversely, the unfortunate part of the job is who's not living up to yeah. expectations? Who's not doing what, pulling their weight? And in a company of our size, if you feel like someone's not, you know, they could be a drag to everyone else. Exactly. You know, I, I feel like in a small organization, you know, in, in Google, if you're one underperformer in the 100,000 employees or however many employees they have, that impact is not felt as much as a 24 person company where if there's one underperformer, it can actually be a drag on the other employees in a substantial one. So um, out of fairness to the other team members um, and in the interest of keeping a high bar and a high level for everyone within the company, you know, we really want to be um, uh, you, you you have to. Uh, take action if someone's not meeting expectations and if um, they're not aligning with your core values. Uh, but I think we've been very fortunate, Sonny. You know, you you, you talked about this a little bit, but throughout COVID and the gr- what they're all calling the Great Resignation, mm-hmm. we didn't have really any resignations during the Great Resignation, um, and I was really proud of that because I, I I hope that means that you know people are happy with what they're doing, they feel challenged, they feel motivated, and uh, um, so I hope to continue creating an environment like that or even making a better environment um, over time. So, yeah, that's kind of my 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 feeling around, you know, the people in the company. I think that's um, I think that was one thing that drew me to Composely, too, was with the level that we are at, like every position is so crucial and we all really have the opportunity 
to see like the fruits of our labor and to see like the impact that we have I remember when I worked at Target that was my thing is like I just want to know I'm doing a good job I want to see like the impact of what I can do and sometimes it's not always like evident but at Composely it is because like I mean I was brought on to help with this new service and like just to have seen it grown from when I started just shows the impact that it has so I was like oh this is so cool um and like I think the culture is like the culture is everything and I think the reason I love Composely is like despite being a remote work environment you kind of feel close to your team and that was something that was important for me I was like very hesitant to want to work remotely because I do like being around people um but I feel like I can reach out to anyone on the team and like we've also been doing like I did a virtual lunch with Alejo last week and that was nice and like the check-ins with Douglas or even just talking to like some of my team members um that I work with it's like oh this is this is nice and you wouldn't you wouldn't expect that kind of environment from a remote like environment um so I think that's something that honestly stands out too in comparison to other companies. Um, not saying this just to like kiss up, but like I couldn't see myself leaving Composely because you risk risking the culture for me is like finding a culture just like Composely isn't like worth it. Like that's, you could have a great job, you could have like a great role and it could pay like maybe millions and I wouldn't leave because I don't want to be, I don't want to take the risk of not having that same culture. You know, because that's so... I've been in negative, like, toxic work cultures. And it just... Even if it's a job you love, it just doesn't make it worth it. Like, it's so bad. And I think a lot of people... I've talked to a lot of people on our team who've had that same experience in the workplace where it was like, I liked the job, but I couldn't be with, like, the people. So the people really are the organization. I think Caesar knows, too, like, has been in those environments yeah. um, where it wasn't, like, super healthy and like here like we have all the opportunities to grow like I have development conversations with Douglas and even with um Mike I mean that's why I wanted to bring you on was because we had that development conversation I was like wow this really resonated with me I was like he has a <laughs> lot of good things to say um <laughs> because like I, yeah I was just gonna say I mean I you know I've um I've also been in those toxic environments before you know my 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 boss at um uh, one of my previous roles was, um, you know, was, was, uh, just toxic. Um, and he created a culture of fear within the company from the top down. Um, and, you know, non data driven, all about just his feelings and what had made him feel good. And, um, uh, it was, it, it was really tough and it took a mental toll for sure. Um, but you know, I also learned a lot, you know, I mean, I literally, literally learned like so many things never to do. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, just watching the guy like, uh, sometimes yeah, those are more important they, what not to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. I mean, at, at some point there's diminishing returns though. It's like every decision made is just terrible. And, uh, yeah, I think that, 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 that company, I, I'm not even going to mention what company it was or, you know, but, uh, yeah, he, he eventually got ousted. He's no longer there. It's, uh, it was, um, you know, it, it, it was at a high point and just plummeted, um, just purely because of ego. Um, and so, uh, not, not a, not a good, uh, work envi environment and, and those toxic work environments, they do take a toll. Um, for us, we're not, we're not perfect. I, I think we're far from perfect. Uh, you know, I would love to be able to, um, offer more benefits, offer more perks, have more team building activities than we do. And I think with that, you know, I, I always think about kind of resources and time, you know, time is something we're in very short supply. Yeah. I think, you know, Sonny. And so, you know, as we continue to grow, I mean, hopefully we, we will be able to, you know, continue to free up some time to start investing into doing other things. And um, yeah, I would love to do more team building activities. And it's tough in a remote environment to, to keep um, that, you know, to, to keep everyone feeling, um, you know, really in tune with each other, that water cooler effect is, is tough. That's why we have a water cooler meeting every Friday, <laughs> yeah. you know, where we bring everyone together just to chat, um, and, uh, hopefully get to know each other a little bit better. But, um, yeah, we're going to continue thinking about things that we can do to get everybody, um, just, yeah, feeling, feeling like a part of the team and, 
um, understanding what everybody's roles are. And, you know, I think it's, that's, that's really important for the company to continue growing the way that it, that it needs to. As a company, obviously like uh, having remote positions, Sunny being one of them and all the other, other employees, where do you see like the, uh, this type of culture going when, especially in the remote environment, like, do you see it continuing to grow or at one point do you feel like maybe like maybe 10 years from now, who knows, but where it would it would be beneficial for you guys to have like maybe a remote team and also in person? Because I hear a lot of uh, SC, uh, CEOs talk about how like how important it is to have people like physically like in an environment, but then there's others that say that a remote works. It's like kind of like a mix mash of of opinions on on, yeah. uh, on that. So yeah. I mean, what what do you think? And you obviously you have a remote yeah. business, so. <laughs> It's a good question uh, and a tough one. I, I am a bit old school, you know, prior to <laughs> mostly, um, you know, all of the companies I worked for, I was there in person. And um, I do think that there is a water cooler effect where, um, so, you know, for example, being in a very open office environment where everyone's pretty tight together, you overhear conversations that you might not otherwise overhear. And that alone, it's like if you hear something and you have input or you are aware of, oh, wait a second, I don't think they realize, you know, like just having that um, kind of that ability to um for everybody to have more transparency and uh, understanding what's going on. Like I have a feeling that a lot of people, if we're working on a big opportunity, let's say, um, you know, we're working on a big brand um, uh, as, as a potential client, so we're pitching a big brand. I don't think everybody really knows that. Whereas previously in my last company, if we were working on a big deal, everyone in the office knew it because there was, it was like a beehive. It yeah. was buzzing. Everybody's moving. Everybody's talking. We got to get ready for this presentation. The designers are working on the deck and the, you know, and everybody was kind of, and anyone who may, maybe in operations, maybe in finance who were not directly like involved in that, they still knew that that was going on just because they were there in a remote culture that will not happen. They don't know that there's a big opportunity that's come about and 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 that's why we try what we try to do is um uh we tried to we we do these all hands every other week those all hands are meant to talk about our successes our challenges and just kind of what's going on so that you know we can make up for that lack of being there and being physically present and overhearing those conversations so um hopefully that achieves some level of of what being in person would um it, it, going back to the to the main question, you know, I I think maybe in the future we would consider a hybrid potentially. Um, you know, we originally started we had an office in Seattle, and then when COVID hit, we, you know, really it wasn't even fully strategically planned. We started hiring people in different states um, because everybody was remote, and we had a much bigger pool of candidates when you looked at the entire country rather than in one city. That's true. And you know, we, so we found great people like Sunny that we probably would otherwise not have been able to um, have been this not have been able to hire. <laughs> so, um, so I really, I, I think we're all really enjoying the. Um, the remote culture, but I think there are a lot of advantages to being in person. And so in the future, we may move to like a hybrid where if we have concentrations of people, let's say in Seattle or in, in, in another city where there's a bunch of people, maybe we can find a way um, to have uh, an office experience for some of those people. Um, I definitely think though, uh, for, for planning, for example, for annual planning, um, you know, it, it's good to bring people together to do that. We haven't done that yet. And I think that's kind of our next step is, um, you know, we'll want to start bringing hopefully everybody together at Composely at least once a year. Everybody can come together and we can do some team building activities and we can talk about our aspirations for the next year and, and all that good stuff. I think from a management perspective for the kind of the executives doing, you know, in-person annual planning is really important. We've done it remotely. It's not as um, productive. I think, you know, spending a day, you know, just carving out a day or two days where you just sit down and you work through what are we trying to accomplish for the year? You know, what's it going to take to accomplish that? Um, and going through 
a full process, a full kind of two day planning process in person would be really, really beneficial. Um, so to be clear, we haven't done that yet, but I think that that is the next step for us. People are feeling a little bit more, um, you know, uh, comfortable meeting with each other uh, with the COVID situation. And so I think now would probably be a good time to do that. Um, so maybe if we're not doing real, you know, in office experience, you know, we're not having an office experience, bringing people together periodically in different places and for different purposes might be a good way of kind of trying to address that. Yeah, I think so too. I think the main thing, especially what I've learned like working remote is that if you're going to have a remote environment, communication is absolutely yeah. key. Um, yeah. I think I do think we do a good job of keeping people in the loop that need to be in the loop. It is a little bit more difficult in the remote work environment, um, but we do. We have meetings. We... Um, we have Slack as a communication channel, and I think a lot of younger people like me would say that remote is, like, better. <laughs> um, <laughs> just because, like, you know, it, for me, it helps me, like, balance, like, my life, you know? Like, I get my work done, but I'm also at home. I'm not wasting gas, especially with these gas prices. Um, but I think communication is the one thing. I think I was asked about that in my interview. Um, but you just have to make sure you're communicating like effectively. It actually makes you focus on it more, I think, than you do um, in person. Because in person, it's easy because you have people like right there right and you're like you. knowing, yeah. you're reminding yourself to communicate with them. But when you're remote, you got to think about, okay, who should know about this? Um, who do we include? Obviously, time management is in set, uh, like is, is insanely important. And like, I think we also do a good job. I've been places where we have like an ungodly amount of meetings to where no one's getting any actual work done um, because there's just too many meetings. And I think like knowing how to communicate effectively and like also value other people's time because for instance if i was in meetings all day like i wouldn't get any of the actual work i need to have done luckily i don't have that many meetings and i'm only included in the ones that you know i need to be and i'm brought in the loop um so i think that's important i think we've done a good job and i think most people at composely like don't mind the fact that we're all remote especially because we've had so many people move yeah. recently <laughs> like our whole, yeah. whole lot of half of our team has moved to like different states within the time period that they've been here um so it also gives you the opportunity like caesar and i are thinking of moving maybe not anytime soon um but <laughs> give you a little break from having to do all that paperwork <laughs> um, yeah. but um yeah it gives you it does also open up like the talent pool like i wouldn't have this job if it wasn't like a remote position i mean i might have considered i was applying to in-person jobs in different states because i was like oh you know if it happens it happens but like um yeah, I think it's great. Um, obviously, we only have five minutes left, but I did want to ask one last question. I think when it comes to having a, what you would say is not a successful company, I think it's pretty successful. <laughs> um, you know, Mike's not where we want to be yet, but we're going to get there. Um, how do you set realistic goals and expectations, not for your, not just for yourself or for your team leaders or even for like me, but also for the company as a whole? So I, I actually wanted to touch on this maybe a, a little bit earlier. I, I can't remember what our, the topic of discussion was at the time, but I, I wanted to mention this and then, you know, we, we sort of, um, uh, segued into a different topic. But for me, um, I think it was when we were talking about kind of uh, the, when you had posted on uh, Instagram and people were kind of, like, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, um, you know, just saying, hey, I, you know, I want to, uh, I get it if people look at it and just say, oh, I, I snap your fingers and you, you, um, you do what you're passionate about. Well, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. You have to work for everything. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure what you were kind of saying is, you know, you should work towards doing something that you enjoy, not just like, just do it. Tomorrow, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and, and so I would take the same approach for that, that I would, uh, even with our company planning and objectives, which is where do you want to be? Where do you want to be a year from now, uh, realistically, right? So um, if I said a year from now, I want Composely to be a billion-dollar company, that's not realistic. It really isn't. So uh, you want an objective that's that's um, it's um, very aspirational, and you know you, you you have an objective that's realistic, but maybe it's it's a, it's pretty um, challenging to achieve, right? Uh, and then I think, so firstly, kind of envisioning, well, where do I, where do I want to be a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, realistically? Um, and then the next thing is, well, what's it going to take to make that happen? 
Like what are the, let's break that down into smaller steps of how do we actually get there? You know, let me start. Mm -hmm. Can you define what you would um, say is realistic? Like how, like the term real, I obviously know what realistic means, but how do you set precedents for what is realistic? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it is just your gut or a lot of it is, uh, I I mean, if you do have data that you can use, right. So like, like, like I said, again, if, if I wanted to 20 X (laughs) year over year, um, in terms of revenue, let's say 20 X is a very aggressive goal. Um, and, and is that achievable? You know, just Mm -hmm. like, thinking through, okay, well, how do I get there? Let me think. If I do this, 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 and this, can I 20X realistically? Um, And that's where I think, you know, a lot of people in, you know, those two things need to happen. Like you can't just set a goal and then not think about how can it, what's it going to take to actually get there? So maybe if I wanted it, maybe if I wanted a 20X, uh, this, the revenue, I would need $5 million to pour into advertising. And if I add $5 million to pour into advertising, maybe it is realistic that mm-hmm. I can 20 X revenue, but how am I going to get $5 million to pour into advertising? Well, maybe then I need to go and get funding and then, okay, well, if I go and get funding, am I, are we at a place where we can do that? Should we, you know? And so I think it's like starting with, um, an objective and it may not, you know, sometimes the objective. And then when you start going through, well, what's it going to take to get there? You realize oh, what I thought was a realistic objective is maybe not realistic, or uh, maybe I'm actually underselling, like I'm under, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of underestimate or not underestimating what's the word I'm looking for. Um, You know, I'm not giving myself enough credit, like we can do better, we can do more than this. Um, So there's this process, it's like, it's called the destination postcard, where you write out like, at the end of the year. So you could do this personally at the end, you know, it's January one, where do you want to be by the end of the year personally? Um, and, and, and professionally, like, what do you want to accomplish by the end of the year? And you, you write that down, you have that written down and it's like your crystal ball of like, this is exactly where I, if I was here at the end of the year, I would be very, very happy. And then go working backwards from there. What's it going to take? to make that a reality. And you plan that throughout the year. So you keep your eye on the ball and you kind of periodically look at, you know, this is where I'm trying to go. That's my North star. That's where I want to be at the end of the year, but you've broken it down into well in the first quarter of this year in order to get closer to that goal. Here are the things I'm going to do. You know, if you want to be super fit at the end of the year, you want to lose 20 pounds and whatever you can make a plan of, well, I'm going to start walking Q1 of this year, every single day, I'm going to walk for at least 20 minutes in Q2. I'm actually going to start jogging and I'm going to start doing it on Q3. I'm going to start doing some weightlifting mixed in with, you know, is that realistic? Do I really think I'll be able to lose 20 pounds by the end of the year. And if I do all of those things, will that, you know, lend to me losing 20 pounds? Yes, it it, it will. I think I can do it. I'm going to stick to the plan. I'm going to be methodical and sticking to that plan. And sure enough, at the end of the year, you achieve the objective that you set out. So I I think it's really kind of envisioning where do you want the business to be? Uh, If it's a business, where do you, you personally want to be? If it's your own personal goals, and then um, breaking down, you know, what am I going to do to get there? Because if you wait until, you know, the, the fourth quarter of the year, you haven't done, you know, it's like uh, November, ro- October, November roll around, and you've done nothing to actually try and achieve <laughs> that goal, you're going to fail. It's not yeah. going to work. So I think it's taking that, that, you know, that big idea, that big goal that you have, and then breaking it down into bite size objectives, you know, that you work on along the way. And that's, and, and so like the example you were talking about before, Sonny, if people want to work on something that they're, um, passionate about, if they're working a job that they hate, you know, well, okay, maybe by the end of the year, what I'd like to do is, you know, start, um, you know, interviewing for, 
something that I really enjoy. And so they have to look at, you know, what are the steps they're going to take over the year to get to a point where they're ready to interview for a position in the area that they want to be in, you know, um, because yeah, it's not a snap your fingers and all, magically it happens. You got to work for it. You have to figure out where do I want to be and how am I going to work to get there? Um, and I think maybe that's what some of the people missed when they were commenting on your um, <laughs> yeah. idea, the idea of working a job that you're passionate about, you know, is not something to, um, is, 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 uh, you know, it's not something that should be mocked or anything, you know, it, 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 it's the journey to get there that is, um, you know, is the, is the tough part. So just, um, I think maybe they, you know, a lot of the people are just saying it's not as easy as saying it. And I think, um, that's true. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean it's unachievable. It is achievable. You just have to come up with your plan and you have to be focused on wanting to really wanting to get there. And I think with that, like you grow a lot when you actually set like the realistic goals and you go after what you want. Um, and unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, Mike had so much amazing things to say. Great. Honestly, I could talk about it for like hours. I think there's so many different topics that we could discuss. So maybe we can get you on the podcast another time. I do appreciate you coming on and doing this with us. I think it's going to be super beneficial for other people to hear. Um, so thank you, Mike. And yeah, I hope you have a great day and like good lunch with your cousin. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, guys. No, I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, Caesar, it's great having the chance to meet you. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation and, and hope, hope it is interesting to, uh, uh, to your viewers. So, uh, thanks again. Really appreciate it guys. Uh, love what you're doing and, uh, Sonny, we'll see each other on Monday. <laughs> see you Monday. Bye, Mike. All right. Thanks guys. See you later. Bye. So thank you everyone for listening th to this episode. Um, I do work with Mike. He is a CEO of my company. Well, not my company. It's his company. But the company I work for, I always say my company. Um, yeah, I think he has a lot of knowledge to share. That's kind of why I brought him on. I think this was a really great conversation to have. I greatly enjoyed it. And I think everyone can benefit from hearing it. But this has been Growing Together with me, Sunny Vasquez. And me, Cesar Santos. Thank you, everyone, for listening. See you guys later. <laughs>